So we're 48 hours post Berlin Marathon now. Unfortunately, when at the end of the race, we had a hard, very hard time finding the videographer. There was 50,000 people at the end of the race and we, we and the internet wasn't working because everyone was trying to use 4G at the same time, 5G. So we don't have much footage after the race. So I figured we'd wait a couple of days. We're now in Munich at Oktoberfest. Um, it's uh, 9.30 in the morning. And we'll do a quick post-race reflection on how the Berlin Marathon went. Um, 2.24.37, I think, was the official time. 36 on my watch. Obviously, far from the goal, but I am not disappointed at all. I'm obviously not stoked and over the moon about it but I people that have followed me on social media and struggle would know that I struggled with an injury in the last couple of weeks and in the second last episode I pulled out of a workout due to a hamstring uh, pain which I'm still not 100% sure what it is I think it is an SI joint pain but then a physio in Australia is telling me it's probably not that it's probably something else we're trying to get to the bottom of it it's right up above the very top of my hamstring bottom of my glute and it came good after a couple of days and then in the final strength session that I did on Tuesday five days before in the afternoon after the track session that you'll see a bit of footage of soon I was doing some exercises on the ground and I felt a twinge and at first I thought just stay calm don't worry about it I obviously stopped the following day it was very painful to the point where I told Green behind the camera here that I was 50 50 if I'd be able to race Morning from Denia, the home of Freddie Ovet, who is currently doing a advertisement for Super Sapiens glucose monitoring device. I think that's all they do. I'm actually not sure, but he's doing a little documentary for them around Berlin Marathon uh, on top of the saw one that we're doing, and we're doing our last workout, which is on Tuesday morning, five days before. It's only a 70% effort, I guess. Um, Freddie's going to do 6 by a K. Uh, I'm either going to do 6 by a K with him, depending on if I'm allowed to run with him. He might want the footage to be just him. Um, Rick has prescribed 3 by a mile, but they're more or less the same workout. Um, it's just taking the legs over at marathon pace a little bit quicker and having a short rest and going again. It doesn't really matter, in my opinion, what you're doing today, as long as it's not too hard and you've got some, some running at marathon pace or close. So you could do 10 400s. I think Nick Best is doing that. You could do three or four by a mile. You could do six by a K. You could do seven by two minutes. It's really not good enough. As long as you're priming your legs, I think, and having a bit of rest and not pushing too hard, it's all that matters. Five days to go. Yeah, really excited about this. And uh, yeah, after this, it's just jogging. So we're pretty much at the end of the block. Last one, mate. How'd you go? It's good. Very good, yeah. Nice uh, just to spin the legs a little bit before Sunday. Yeah. The point of the workout, I guess, was just to like run with a bit of rhythm, not trying, not getting any fitter at the moment, you know, so unfortunately. So, um, yeah, well, 6 by K started at like your marathon pace and 319. got down to 307, so that was great. Just nice to run with, with Matt on the track and just feel relaxed and... Yeah. Feel good. That, that was the whole point, just to feel good, you know. What did you do in your last two weeks of training? So running re wise, rewind, yeah, running wise. We know you yeah. <laughs> rode at twenty hours a week. Um, so I did this track workout today. On Saturday, I did a twenty k easy run, like sort of around four minute k pace, and then we did that uh, track workout on Tuesday. Okay, that's all. I didn't do any running between that, honestly. Um, that was a good workout for me. Two days before that, I think you did 30k. And then oh, three days. Before and then that. three days before oh, that, I did 30k oh. again at like sort of four minute k pace in the heat, mm. which was good. Yeah. But but yeah, you have to be careful because it is so hot here, as you know. Um, so I haven't run that much actually in the last two weeks, but every every run has been kind of really good quality. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I've I've ridden a good amount as well, obviously, and and been feeling really good on the bike lately. So. Um, 
yeah, I, I think it's correlating both both sports really well at the moment. So we've made it to Berlin. I'm staying at my friend Philip Barr's house, who's the captain of the Adidas Berlin team. And I guess today, so it's Thursday morning, so we're 72 hours out from the race more or less exactly now. And this is when the carb loading begins. So what I'm doing now is I'm starting to... I'm keeping my diet more or less the same as normal, except I'm trying to tip the percentage of carbohydrates higher, obviously. So normally in my regular day, I'd have you know, very roughly maybe 50 to 60% carbs, the rest protein and fats. I'm trying to shift that more towards 80%. 70 to 80%. I'm not strict with it. Uh, some people are, some people are, I never have been. But one way to easily do that is rather than drink water, drink water with carbs. And the the most, I'm not too knowledgeable at this, so I don't feel like going into much detail because I might get something slightly wrong and someone in the comments is going to get in there and, uh, <laughs> and fix me up. <laughs> but maltodextrin, from what I understand, is the, firstly, Morton is mostly maltodextrin. So this is a cheaper version of, of Morton to save a bit of money. This is from Decathlon, one of Europe's big uh, sports chains, uh, retailers. And this is just pure maltodextrin. And maltodextrin, from what I understand, is a rather than glucose, it's just quite fast acting. You put glucose in your system, you can quickly call upon it to use it for energy. This is more of a longer, slow release um, form of carbs, from what I understand. And uh, Morton, I believe, has both, uh, mostly maltodextrin, but I'm gonna basically have two of these every day. This is just in small packets. <clears throat> every day. And so is Rain behind the camera, because she's doing Berlin Marathon as well. So I'm gonna have two of these every day for the next three days. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So we've both got uh, six of these. Otherwise, you know, try to. I'm trying to avoid having big meaty meals. Last night I had a big Indian curry, which is the last big, you know, meaty meal I'll have, uh, mainly because it was just around the corner, I didn't actually go and seek that, um, but yeah, so, so for the next three days, it'll be a lot of banana, uh, bananas, a lot of fruit, so I, I, I always eat a lot of fruit, so that, that, that's not really changing, so berries, um, pastas, sandwiches, uh, I'll have cereals that are high in carbs, that's really it, you know, people really requested a lot of information about the carb loading during this week. I don't think you need to go crazy about this stuff. Uh, I really don't. I think you just need to just tip the percentage of what you're eating a little bit more towards the carbs. Uh, I do think that this maltodextrin stuff is... I, I've done this before the last few marathons. So one of my friends in Finland, Aki Numula, hope he's watching this, uh, 217 marathoner. He taught me all about this a few years ago. And ever since, I have done it. So three days before, I start to increase this. And the, day, the night before, I'll have a Morton because that's got the additional electrolytes and so forth. Um, and they've got their own little hydrogel mix, which uh, I don't think anyone fully understands except Morton, but um, it obviously works. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll obviously take a scene before the morning of as well, but this is the carbo loading, this is where it starts, 72 hours before, um, and it's pretty much as simple as that. So I'm gonna put one of these in here, one of these goes in there, so that's, that's 500 mils, so it's a litre. Um, that in itself tips the carbs much higher than normal because normally I just drink water during the day or I drink an electrolyte tablet in water which is no carbs, it's just electrolytes. So now I'm going to go ice my hamstring which has been bothering me for the last two weeks and that bothered me again two days ago. I, I was actually really worried yesterday that I may not race which sounds crazy because on Tuesday I did the track workout with Freddie, I did six by a K and then in the afternoon I did my last strength session which was no weights, it was just a few exercises on the ground and I was doing one with lying on my back with my, uh, oh, this kitchen's too small, but I was basically lying on my back, lifting my glute up like that, so putting pressure on my hamstring. And in one of the reps, I felt a twinge, and I stopped immediately, and I went, oh my goodness. And uh, the next day, so that was yesterday, the next day, I was walking around with, in a little bit of pain, and I was thinking, this is a disaster. Like, this is, this is not ideal. But it seems like it's a sciatic nerve twinge, which is, I've had some help, from uh, Pedro um, from Portugal, one of my longtime friends, and he said it's going to be okay. You just got to stretch it, stretch it out. And today I just jogged very easily, a short jog, and I was fine. So uh, I felt it a little bit in the beginning, but it warmed up and it was okay. So I'm going to go ice my hamstring, and then we're going to go out for a bit of a day of sightseeing before uh, meeting up with Freddie and a couple of friends later on today. Let's go. <laughs> Good morning. It's 24 hours before the race now. 9.46, we start at 9.15 tomorrow, so we'll 
We'll be about uh, 10k into the race at this point tomorrow. We've got a shakeout run now, Sweat Elite Mass Athletics. Should have a small crowd coming along, looking forward to meeting some people. Um, figuring out these undergrounds is a, is a, it's not a challenge, but we've had a few times where we've got a little bit lost. But uh, yeah, we're gonna do a shakeout run, then go drop our bottles off at the, at the uh, hotel, and we'll, we'll do a bit of footage of that as well. And then just rest up. Okay, so preparing the race day fuel. So uh, in the next two hours, I have to submit my drinks to the event. So the elite field and the sub elite field, I'm fortunate enough to be in the sub elite field. We get to submit our own personal drinks and have them at stations 5k, 10k, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. So 5k drink. So the, I just bought these from the supermarket. Um, they all cost 50 cents each. I emptied them all. And so this is this drink I'm going to have at um, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. Whether I take them all or not, I don't know. I'll try to take them all. The reason for the slightly bigger bottles is that Christian Ulriksen from Norway, who's trying to run sub-220 with us, he doesn't have the tables. He was too late to apply for the sub-elite field. So I told him that I would get bigger bottles to give half to him. So these are 500 mils because he's going to run with us for at least 30k, uh, hopefully through to the end. So in these bigger bottles, I'll have a Morton. 320 in each of them. Of course, these 330 ml bottles uh, are probably too small for the full Mortons because these take 500 ml. Um, so I'll distribute these two Morton caffeine ones over one, two, three, four, and five. I have another Morton caffeine sachet in my room, so I'll do that. And I'm also going to mix in with all of them half of a packet each of this LMNT. So they were nice enough to send me some product during the video series. It's got a thousand milligrams of sodium, which is massive. And because I'm a heavy sweater, that's good for trying to prevent the cramps, although we don't really know why the cramps happen, but it's good to cover all bases. So I'm gonna prepare all this, and I'm gonna take with me, some people like to strap the gels to the bottles, but I prefer to have them on me. I've once had an uh, annoying experience where I couldn't like take the bottle off the gel, so I'm just gonna put them in my sore pants, my sore shorts, here and here, and here and here. And I'll probably have these gels between 10 and 15, one then, one between 20 and 25, one between 30 and 35, so three. And you know, you probably don't really need any more gels than that if you've got <laughs> this much carbs. Ultimately, there's no real difference between taking a gel or taking a Morton drink, they're both carbs. One will, you know, the gel often just sits in your gut for a little bit longer. So that's the race plan, right there. It's a lot of uh, carbs, but that's what you need to get through a uh, two hour 20 effort when your heart rate's at uh, <laughs> threshold, more or less. So there we go. 510 all the way through to 40k. It's possible I might miss one because you're running quick through these stations. Sometimes you fumble and you miss one, so you know it's okay if I miss one. I think ideally I don't want to miss uh, any more than that, but that is the game plan. Go Cubs! <laughs> yes. 630. 15 start, two hours, 45 minutes before. Normally hit two and a half to three, somewhere in there, not too strict. Got white bread. <clears throat> I've already had half of this. I've <laughs> realised when I was halfway through eating it that we're supposed to film this. Of course, banana. And one of these Morton Barnes solids. I tried it the other day and it, you know, sat well on my stomach. So it's just multi, you know, mostly carbohydrate, multidextrin, and then a uh, an electrolyte tablet. Um, I would just take any one. This is just one from Decathlon, which is actually a power bar one, I just realised now, I didn't even know. It's got 75 milligrams of caffeine, and then of course, the Monster. I haven't started drinking that yet, but I'll probably drink half of that. That's it, the pre race meal, so I've already had half, so it's a bit bigger. There's three, and then the electrolyte, and then on the way, so I'm going to just drink this uh, Morton with a bit of the LMNT drink which is also in my drinks in the race. So I'll just sip on this on the way and throw it out at the start line. It's a, it's a bottle that I can throw away. So yes, it's almost happening. I'm very excited.
and um, we're going to get to the start area about an hour and 15 before so we can do have a bit of a chat with some people around there so the last the last meal here it is 826 so we have uh, we've got 50 minutes so we're gonna get started then the weather could not be any better I don't think I mean personally I would probably prefer it five degrees cooler but I think for the average person it's uh, it's ideal it's about 11 degrees absolutely no wind so you can't uh, no one's complaining no one's blaming the weather today for poor performances that's for sure um, yeah, the plan for me is still 70 flat at halfway. Hasn't changed. Hopefully within 15 seconds. Ready? Feel it out. Feel we'll it see. Out. I, don't, I don't really have a concrete uh, pace or group, more or less. I'm going to feel it out, but I imagine it'll be 225 to 230 sort of group and just feel it out. Uh, we'll see. Matt, can you explain the yeah, blue explain, hair? Maybe explain the blue hair. Yeah, <laughs> so I got roped into doing this by Nick Bester, so it's a Best Athletics thing, and uh, yeah, there's a few people with blue hair that are representing Best Athletics, which is which is obviously the single that I'm running in as well. Um, yeah, somehow he roped me into doing it, but uh, I'm just hoping it doesn't, when yeah. I'm sweating, it doesn't go all in my face. That's going to be annoying. But uh, <laughs> he, he, he's assured me that that doesn't happen, so we're going we're gonna to hope for the best. Can't miss him. But, uh, so have it, Reem, Christina, you ready to go? Oh yeah. yeah. So yeah. pumped. Yeah. <laughs> so you're gonna go out here. So you're, you're gonna take it easy. Yeah. Start two mile, no okay, faster so than eight, eight fifteen, and then pick it up after that. Then I can get pumped. <laughs> hey, Christina, your first marathon. Yeah, I'm quite nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can arrive walking or running and uh, not too bad. Point where I told Green behind the camera here that I was 50 50 if I'd be able to race. Um, that was stressful, but I kept calm. <clears throat> uh, I took anti inflammatories, I iced religiously, I did Epsom salt baths, I did everything I could. I got a light massage. Uh, I jogged a couple of days, I took a few days off, jogged a couple of days at jogging intensity. It felt okay, I could, I could notice it, but it wasn't painful, but I could feel it. Ideally, in the last few days, I'd do a little bit of work at marathon pace, a couple of minutes, a couple of Ks. I was too worried to do that because I thought it would hurt my hamstring. I figured I'd better off saving it. Lined up, felt okay warming up. I only jogged because I was just making sure that if I'm going to have pain and it's going to get worse, I might as well make, do it in the race and not before the race. Uh, it hurt straight away in the first while. Um, not that badly. I took a very heavy-duty painkiller uh, prescription. <laughs> um, Nick Bess has sorted that out for me. It was bearable in the first 10k. I was pretty optimistic at that point. It became a little worse in the second 10k. Halfway, um, yeah, I, I, I noticed around 20 to 21, right around halfway, that I, I, I just knew I wasn't running normally. I was favorite, I was compensating. Um, Nick noticed that too. Uh, uh, told me after the race that he could tell. And at 25k, I took a stride that wasn't, that, that my hamstring didn't like and I felt a jolt. Uh, that's when I had to let go of Nick. We paced perfectly through 10K and through half. I think it was 70, 14 or 70. I don't know what the official one was on my watch. It was 1, 1 10, 14, which is pretty much exactly what we wanted. We wanted 1, 10 to 1, 15, you know, ideally. We said give or take 15 seconds of 1, 10. So we were happy with that. But at 25K, when my hamstring jolted, I knew immediately that I wasn't going to run through 20. And in fact... Even well before halfway, I did think to myself, based on how my hamstring was was. I remember thinking to myself, if I run under two twenty within this in with this hamstring thing, because I wasn't, it was just a two out of ten pain all the time. I thought it's going to be a bit of a miracle. Twenty five k, I knew it was over. I knew I wasn't going to run under two twenty at that point. But I thought, you know, I, I I only ever drop out of races when I can't run anymore. Like when I can't, like in Valencia in December and in Rotterdam in. Um, April, I dropped out because I couldn't run. I, my, 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 I cramped so badly, I was unable to walk. I couldn't actually move forward. And so I stuck with that attitude and I said, I'm going to keep running, even if it's painful, until I cannot run. And luckily, that didn't happen. Um, you know, I had the thought of running 222 for a while. I thought that'll be a good run. That slipped away uh, a bunch of jolts in the hamstring through, uh, you know, 30K to 36K. 
36k, which is about 22 and a half miles. Um, that's when my mindset really started to slide downhill. And I thought, should I drop out? Is my hamstring destroyed here? Uh, what happens if this is doing so much damage? I'm not going to be able to recover anytime soon. Yeah, it's, it's horrible running, thinking, I'm going to finish. I'm not going to finish. I'm going to drop out. No, I've got to finish. I've only got 5k to go. My hamstring's so sore that I should probably save it because if it's... So, a little bit of backstory. In March 2020, I ran with a sore Achilles at Lake Biwa and ran a PB, PR, 224-23. And I lined up the sore Achilles, took a lot of painkillers, ran, and I struggled with Achilles tendonitis badly for a year after that. Full year. I'd only got the Achilles pain in the last few weeks. I didn't know what it was at the time, although I assumed it was tendonitis because most people struggle with that at the Achilles area. And so I started thinking, is that going to happen again? And is it going to be worth it? Is it going to be worth it to finish here in a, in a time that's not what I wanted and then struggle with an issue for a year again? But I just... So all those thoughts went through my head in the final 5K. It was a very difficult time. People were flying past me. Lisa Waitman flew past me, Australian, uh, who ran 224 flat at 41K, which I was happy to see her. Max Rahm, uh, shout out to Max, he ran a huge PB, he ran 223, he flew past me. Cooper Berry flew past me in the last little bit, he ran 224, a six minute PB. All these people flying past me did not help the uh, mindset, even though I was quite happy to see some of them and I'm very happy that they ran so well. Um, so, but you know, I think the thing that got me through was I knew I'd DNF the last two marathons in Valencia and Rotterdam and I, I, I couldn't bear the thought of of DNFing again the third time. So I just thought, you gotta get to the end. You gotta get to the end, even if you have to walk, just avoid it being more than an eight out of 10 pain, you know, just get to the end. And luckily I didn't have to walk. I had to slow down to about six minute mile pace to run with this sort of slightly straight leg. And I was a little bit surprised actually to see 224. I thought it was gonna be a bit slower. I thought it was gonna be about 226 or 227 because I wasn't really looking at my watch in the final five miles. I was just, I knew it was ugly. So I just didn't want to know. I just thought one foot in front of the other, get to the end. And you know what? Now I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I did. I'm so happy I got to the end. I'm so happy I finished in a time that two years ago was my PB, PR. So yeah, I mean, I could go into much further detail, which I'll probably will in a podcast episode soon about how the race played, uh, played out. But this is obviously a short summary, but um, I'm content with that. I really am, even though the Sub-220 project didn't end the way that I hoped. Uh, I'm very proud that I finished because it, knowing at 25K, even having a suspicion pre-25K that I wasn't going to do it, but knowing at 25K it was game over. There's no way I'm going to go on 220 because my hamstring at that point was so sore. It was getting worse. And then just thinking for all the way between 36 and 39, literally every 30 seconds, I was like, I'm going to drop out here. I'm going to drop out here. This is too painful. This is not worth it. And to get through that, um, I'm really proud of. But we have a few questions that have come through, um, of which I'll answer as well. So, but uh, while we're getting them up, I just wanna say a massive, massive thank you to people that tracked uh, the race. I know that a lot of you did. Um, I know it would have been a little bit disappointing in the second half to know I was sliding off that pace. I thought of people, <laughs> I thought of, people tracking and how that would not be fun to know um at 30k that split you know I, you know you're off the pace huge congratulations to nick bester who i ran with for 25k and at 25k when my hamstring went he was urging me to continue he didn't really know the extent of the pain at the time um he was really uh urging me to continue on with him he ran 2208 and just missed it devastated for him but a huge pb almost almost a full minute well done nick I'm so pumped to uh, to have run with you for that long, um, 25k. Uh, I'm very proud of your result, and I look forward to doing a training build up with you very soon towards the next marathon. Rain. So this first question you kind of very much touched base on. So yeah. I know for myself when things start to go wrong, I've kind of planned an A B C kind of plan before I get into a race. So how do you keep yourself motivated um, when things are especially going off? <coughs> You even posted saying that after seeing Nick take off, it was kind of it was rough when you saw Nick take off in a sense. Yeah. Um, you touched base on it a little bit just now, but can you go a little bit? Yeah. Into um, like I said, when you sign up 
<clears throat> when you sign up for a marathon, I, I, I've I've done eight now. I've, I've entered ele- I've entered twelve. I've made the start line of eight, and yeah, I've come to realize something that's very simple, but I never accepted it really until very late. When you sign up for a marathon, and you sign up for a proper training block of 90 mile a week, or even if it's 60 miles a week, it's a lot of running, 100k, 90k. You are signing up to do something that your body is gonna struggle to complete. It's not gonna do it easily. You're asking a lot of your body, (laughs) of your muscles, of your tendons, of your ligaments, of your bones, of your energy. And you have to accept it when things go wrong, when you get sick, when you get injured, when you have a niggle, when you have a headache, when you feel so tired you don't want to run. This is what you've signed up for. You've signed up for this. It's a part of the marathon journey, all the half marathon, all the 10K, all the 5K. This is part of it. This is what comes with the package. And even though that's very straightforward and everyone would agree with that, it took me a long time to actually really accept that. And, and now I've accepted it. And I accepted it a little while back and that when these niggles pop up, it, 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 that's what... You shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I mean, you should do everything you can to avoid it. Yes. And you can do things to avoid it. And you can do things to help the recovery and so forth. But you can't be shocked. You've asked your butt around 150 kilometers a week on average for 12 weeks or something like that. Maybe 145. That's, nu- that's nuts. It's something that your body doesn't, shouldn't do. <laughs> I don't know if it shouldn't do it, but it's, it's asking a lot. So... I've probably gone away from the question a little bit there. How do I deal with it, you know, mentally? You know, I, I, when Nick kicked off at 25K and I wasn't going to do it, I wasn't going to stop. Like, I've got no other marathon planned at that point. I'm going to get to the end. I'm only stopping a marathon when I cannot, I'm not dropping out of a marathon because I don't feel good. I'm not, that's not, it's not what I, it's not, not what I do. I know some people do that and there's sometimes a good reason for that. I've never done that and I'm never going to do that. Um, I'm dropping out when I can't run anymore. And I could run to the end. And I did worry. Through 25K to 39K, I did worry. Am I, am I going to get to a point where I can't move? And that's going to suck. But luckily I didn't get there. Um, so I have two more questions. I guess I'll ask the third one. Um, how would you say the strength training has helped you throughout this process? Yeah, I've had that question a lot and it's a hard one. I, I mean, Keith is amazing and I, I know for sure that that was beneficial. But ultimately... And I, you know, I came to Keith mostly to try and figure out the cramping. And I actually didn't cramp until the very end. I cramped after th- about 39.5, I think. And they weren't that... They weren't chronic. They were, like, r- sort of normal. And that's very late. That's the latest I've ever cramped. Indianapolis was the latest I cramped, and that was 38, I think, or 37. But that was freezing cold. So um, if it is anything related to a lack of sodium and sweat... in Indianapolis, it was two degrees Celsius, 35 degrees Fahrenheit. I wasn't sweating at all. This one, it was a bit warmer. It wasn't warm. It was 12 degrees. Um, I don't know what that is, 52 or something Fahrenheit. But I was sweating a lot. So <clears throat> I think it definitely did help. Um, it's a bit of a bummer that I'm linking the injury with the last strength workout because it's probably a bit... Um, it's not, probably not exactly what it was. Like, it, it probably was a, you know, it was probably the combined running and the run training and the gym. But I think it has helped me and I will continue to do it moving forward, yes. I think I've just got to be a little bit more careful in the last couple of weeks. Um, since you did mention your cramping, I remember you telling me on um, the race that you PR'd at 224. Mm. Um, it sounds a lot similar to what happened here in Berlin. Uh, would you say that the strategy of how you started the race was kind of a component that also helped the cramping delay? Starting slower. Yeah. Helped the cramping delay. Probably, yeah. Yeah, going out slower. We felt great going through in 70, you know, not with my hamstring, but aerobically. It felt really, really comfortable. Um, yeah, I would say so. Um, I think that going a little bit slower obviously meant that we had more in the tank and we were below our threshold, further below our threshold uh, earlier on in the race. So I would say that that was definitely helpful. Yeah, and moving forward, I'll probably do the first half of races. I probably won't be so ambitious, um, you know, to try and target race, uh, times that I'm probably, if, if next time I know I'm in 217 shape, which I've been in before, I know I have, and I arguably I probably was close to that shape two weeks ago. Um, I think it's still really important to take it conservatively in the first half. 
Um, so you did post on Instagram it was a wonderful photo of a description of kind of what happened. Mm. Um, I will say it was incredibly moving to read that and got very emotional. Um, and you did mention that you learned a lot from your mistakes and and it, I was shocked to read that like you selected another one and you said that you're going to learn from what happened this past weekend and, and move forward. Yeah. And so quickly you've already possibly <clears throat> chosen a marathon of what you're going to do. Um, so how, how, how are you, after everything that just happened and all the pain um, and not PRing, how, how are you so motivated to click something? There's probably a few answers to that, but the, the, the simple one is I know I can run, I know I can run 215s one day, not now, but I know I can, and I know for sure I can run two, 219, and I haven't done it yet, and I, I think about, <laughs> I think about, I think about this last night at Octoberfest randomly when I was talking to someone about PRs, I, I put myself 40 years into the future as a, uh, as a 75 year old guy, <laughs> and I don't want to look back and think, until, you know, my kids or, or, you know, young people that I ran 220 knowing I could have run faster, but I just never did it. I know I can and I will, and I'm not going to stop until I do. So I think for me, it was just the build up went very well. I got unlucky at the very end. I ran it. I ran it as well as I possibly could given the circumstances. Let's go again. Let's go again. I need a bit of a rest. I probably need at least a few weeks off. I'm trying to diagnose this thing now virtually by two physios online, which is not easy. Um, but yeah, it's simple in my eyes. It's like the marathon doesn't go to plan 50 to 70% of the time for everyone, anyone except Elliot Kipchoge. I don't know how that guy does it every time, but he, he, he nails it 95% of the time. He had that one bad run in London Marathon a few years ago. And you just got to, that's, that's, just, that's just how it works. You, when you go to the casino, you win half the time, roughly, or... 45, 48% of the time. It's pretty much the same in the marathon. Like between 30 and 50% of the time, it works out. The other time, it doesn't. For many different reasons, it can not go to plan. And, you know, instead of getting emotional and trying to figure it out why, try and figure out why. But if you can't and it was just bad luck, just move on into the next one. Look forward to it and build up and keep moving forward. It's very interesting that you say that, especially with your time. I completely agree with you. You're totally capable of running it. Yeah. Much faster than a 217, 215. Um, and there was this fun joke between us that, you know, we're going to try to beat each other's time by an hour. Because mm. I'm an hour exactly behind you. And we have the same goal, just the 320. Um, would you say that a good strategy to have when it comes to picking a selected PR time for that? Would you say going a bit slower um, instead of just jumping to like a good five minute PR and, and kind of just going about it? within a minute or two. Yeah, well that's what I'm doing, right? Selection. Yeah, I mean, I've run 2.20.46, um, so I'm trying to break that by a minute now. So essentially that's, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to jump to, I've, I've taken big steps before. I went 2.59, 2.43, 2.35, 2.27, 2.24, 2.20. I've taken big jumps. Now it's getting to the point of my physical limits, but I really do believe they're at about 2.15. That's just what I believe. Um, I don't know if I'm right, but that's what I believe, just based on my training, based on my progression, um, and so I'm gonna, tr I'm gonna, I I'm gonna keep running until I run a race where I'm like, I can't go any faster than that, and I believe that I'm gonna get to that point in the next two or three years. I'm gonna do a build up, it go 95% to plan, run a race, and think, I, I don't know if I can go any faster than that. I just, that's that that's what I'm waiting for, and I haven't got to that point. I, I don't think I'm super close either. Well, I will end this by saying it was really impressive. Um, Thank you. Um, everything that you, both you, Nick, and everybody that laid out there this past weekend. Um, another incredible thing I thought was how touching this journey has been for everybody around you. Mm. Uh, I know for myself, and just I... being able to see so many people come up to you after saying, oh my God, it's you, seeing you at Oktoberfest, everyone taking photos with you. <laughs> what would you like to say? I couldn't believe how I was overwhelmed at the end of the race by how many people recognized who I was. I, I it was inc it was incredible. Um, you know, just asking if I did it, if I broke two twenty. Yeah, thank you to everyone that's followed along, um, sent messages, post you know Strava comments. Um, there's like a hundred and forty comments on my thing. I haven't even looked at them yet. I just I I sometimes feel a bit bad that I don't respond to every one. 
um, but I do read them all. Uh, you know, it's something not always straight away. And but thank you so much to everyone that's followed along and sent messages and and and, and counts me after the race and tracked. Uh, yeah, it's really special. I didn't really expect uh, the response to this series and. There's definitely ideas to do something again around the next build up. Uh, it might be a little bit different, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for everyone on the track. I really, really appreciate it, and um, I really hope that I've been able to, uh, you know, teach some people a few things about the marathon. I certainly don't feel like I've uh, mastered this game yet. I feel like I'm quite a way off that, but I hope that what I share helps others and inspires others. And um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for sharing this journey. I know for myself. I've completely enjoyed it and seeing everyone else around us, I think the positive feedback has, says that everyone did too. And totally looking forward to the next one and, and seeing what you're about to give us. Thank you so much, Ren. <laughs>